Hi, I'm Ian Brown, Managing Director of Excel Point, and you're listening to On Point. For those of you who haven't heard of us, we're a global leader in the development of innovative no-code software technology. We help businesses all around the world to update their outdated business processes, overcome challenges, automate workflows, streamline processes, and generally with the aim of increasing uh, efficiency and productivity. We do this by implementing innovative, automated, highly flexible and adaptable no-code software. And typically we do that 10 times faster than bespoke software development. But we still retain the flexibility and ability to change and adapt quickly as the company grows and evolves. Today, we're joined by Gary Hosey. Gary is a founder of EI Company, with 25 years experience delivering high value coaching and training programs to organisations internationally. One of a selected group of master trainers in EQ I20 tools for enhancing emotional intelligence. He has carried out 7,000 plus one-to-one sessions, um, encompassing feedback uh, and acting on that, making him one of the top experts in this area. Gary brings real life understanding to leadership, management and team development. So Gary, thanks for joining us today. An absolute joy. Thanks for the introduction. Sounds amazing. Yeah. And I have to say, emotional intelligence. If my wife was here, she might say, well, Ian has none of that. (laughs) Mine would as well. So tell me a little about emotional intelligence for the audience. Probably most people have heard of the phrase emotional intelligence now, because we see it and we hear about it on social media. All the time, even the government talks about well-being, emotional intelligence, etc. In its, in its everyday form, it's basically our human behaviour. Yep. The concept of emotional intelligence has just brought together elements of that behaviour in a way that we can understand how we work, um, uh, how we are in life, how we get the best from what we want to do, whether that's personal or professional. So what makes it up are things like confidence, assertiveness, self-awareness, empathy, relationship, how we use emotions in decision-making, which of course that's the psychology of decision-making is a whole industry on its own, um, and how we cope in life. So I know in the past I've been involved with um, personality profiles. Mm. So I know there's different methodologies for personal mm. personality profiling. And I guess that gets you into a, a general bucket of you fit this particular profile and there'll be some very general um, aspects to that as well as specifics. I know working in software development, for example, the personalities, you know, we are very much the IT crowd. Um, so I guess emotional intelligence is taking a number of um, well-proven methodologies and scientifically backed uh, and psychologically backed um, theories and advancing on what we've done for decades previously to a better understanding of the human condition sort of thing. I think you've captured it really well. Um, when, When you think about you know, the human condition, our ability to get on in life, get on with others, uh, function uh, well, effectively, and enjoy life, and and to navigate that complexity. We need certain behaviours to be successful in that. And you and I would probably easily confirm that between the ages of 20 to where we are now, we've learnt a few things along the way old head on young shoulders and all that. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, under that banner of um, self-awareness, there are many elements of that. Personality would be one. Yeah. So that's useful information, and it helps me understand, well, what does my personality type mean, how I show up, and how do I work with somebody who might be different? One element with personality is that that's what we would call fixed data so that means that once we reach early adulthood around 18 my personality is not going to change whereas emotional intelligence as you've said is a collection of these scientifically validated um, uh, subscales around behaviors and competencies 
and because it's around behavior and competency, they're all movable. So there can be elements of my behavior that are actually too much, and, I, and with self-awareness I can pull that back, or elements that actually are underdeveloped, or even blind spots that I yep. can actually develop. I see. So for a business owner, yes. employing however many employees in business, how can a business deploy your skill sets yeah. to better improve, let's say, the workforce, whether it's well-being, the overall culture, mm. whether it's efficiency, you know, what it, whatever it is the business is trying to achieve with the workforce in particular? <clears throat> I, think, I think some of the fundamental areas that emotional intelligence brings huge value um, so let's take the business owner to start with. As a business owner, you're a leader of the organization. And for a lot of the businesses that we have worked with, they might have had no formal training in that ability to lead. So understanding what does leadership behavior look like and how do I show up in that? Yep. So it's not unusual that in a leadership context that one element of emotional intelligence, which is called self-regard, which is about confidence, assuredness. Actually, for leaders, they score themselves quite low in that. They might present themselves as a, as a confident leader, but inside they're always thinking, I'm making this up as I go along, or I'm not really skilled in this. Imposter syndrome. Y you've said it in one. And we all experience that, nobody escapes that. So for the business leader, emotional intelligence gives that rounded understanding about how is my behavior and how do I get the very best out of that? And that gives them a foundation to actually understand other people's behavior. So when we talk about trusted relationships in a team or how we look after our client relationships in the most meaningful way, then these behaviors um, speak to all of that in a, in a big way too. So presumably, when we're talking about leadership, you must work with um, your know, senior management team, senior leadership mm. teams, the, the upper echelon, so that they are operating cohesively with one voice, with one modus operandi, embodying the culture and values of the organisation, because it's not one single person. One no. single person might be the, the figurehead, leadership comes from the growth of the organization and that being able to be embodied throughout um, so presumably you work with teams mm. of people yeah and and the interesting thing that I found in is that you know let's say leaders of a function in a business so let's say there's five and you've got the the CEO or the MD that yep. makes six they're all looking after an, an element of the organization. And of course that becomes their baby. Yep. It becomes their area of domain. They often have subject matter expert. And it's not that we um, naturally compete as humans, but we do look after what's important to us. So we have barriers to good team working, good relationships in just the way that we're, uh, you know, we're set up. So, so when we're working with a senior leadership team, we often look to create some awareness and understanding that actually we want the same things. So an example would be, we, we've worked with a senior team recently and we had a one day workshop with them and we got them to articulate to the whole group, you know, what do they need to work in this team? What's valuable to them? What do they think is important for how this team develops? Um, and what are some of the behaviors that we should have in the team? And what surprised them all was they all said pretty much the same things. But often, because we don't talk about those in everyday situations, um, we don't feel like we're doing the same thing. We often feel like, well, I, you know, um, one department doesn't support another unless we have to. Yep. And, and we see, but when you get them down into actually what, what is it about and what's important, and we see those things aligned, the penny drops and I've seen leadership teams go, why haven't we noticed this before, how aligned we are? 
that we actually are aiming for the same thing. So just a small intervention like a day can have a really significant impact. So is that an example where <clears throat> the day-to-day -day noise of doing business yeah. gets in the way of the strategy? So strategically, they're reasonably well aligned, but the day-to-day -day chaos that goes on around, which happens in all businesses, <clears throat> that sort of focuses you away from that alignment. Is that, is that as yeah. simple as that? I think it is as simple as that. And, you know, when we look at human behaviour, we think we make a lot of choices in everyday situations, but a lot of our behaviours are on autopilot. They're on well-worn tracks that we're familiar with and we're comfortable with. It's like relationships in our life, those that we know the best, we are most comfortable with. And um, so we do get kind of set on those positions. And of course, when we're in a team in a function, we get really comfortable together. But then when a, another team says, well, can you do it this way? And they're like, well, who are you to say that we should do it this way? Yeah. And it's those frictions. So it is about that alignment, definitely. Interesting. Interesting. And in our world, <clears throat> we have to consider human interaction in a totally different way. Mm. Because we are designing pieces of software, we're always looking at, will the user know what to do? Yeah. Will they know where to look, what to click, what happens next? Naturally, innately. So as humans, we're now taking a lot for granted. And it's because of conditioning over many years that when you pick up the latest smartphone, you immediately know what to do with it. Yeah. Um, so that human-machine interface is also an interesting area for us. Do, do you get involved in any of that? How does your work, if you're working with machines, sort of impact the well-being and so forth? Um, yes, we do actually. Yeah, we've got we we have a couple of organisations that um, are involved with software as well. And um, although they don't have that kind of user interface, there is that challenge of connection, which is what I think you were talking yeah. about. And I guess what we would call what should be common sense, but sometimes isn't so common. Yep. Yeah. And. The more we're able to kind of understand how that human machine works, the more we're able to kind of um, connect and make that common sense sort of line up. And I suspect that that's yep. what you're doing, maybe putting some different words on it. Um, and if you look at it in everyday life, you know, when you look at the TV and you see an advert, it, its goal is to do something yeah but probably the most impact it has is emotionally because they they want that connection yeah. to be able to get the output yeah typical christmas adverts oh yes you know, it's not necessarily the subject matter of the advert yeah. it's all the emotion around it that yeah. you connect, connect with i can relate to that yeah, yeah. so also in the current climate uh, we've done a lot of work with customers where mm. they're sending people home. Mm. You know, they're working from home, they're implementing more flexible business systems. That sounds great for the business because mm. they can you know, now work from anywhere. Work from your desk, work from your office, work from your pocket, etc. But presumably sending people home is a lonely experience. <clears throat> Most people might think it'd be great to work from home, but if you work from home for long periods, that could be quite isolating as well. What are you seeing in the marketplace in that sense? Or, or do you think remote technologies, you know, video meetings and so forth, have largely substituted? I think there's been a bit of both, really. I think you're really, um, you're really feeling the pulse of where things are at with that, Ian. Um, I think organisations have had to accelerate their ability to work remotely. You know, I, you know before the pandemic, a lot of organizations were almost resisting it and we've had to embrace it and we've had to show that um, and demonstrate that we can do that and that has really worked you know certainly you know in 2020 I think there was a lot of success with it but just like you've said that lack of interaction and connection has now led to isolation 
and loneliness and mental health and well-being. And I think to add to that as well, what we're finding with some of our clients is they're, um, because they're available all the time, they're booking their meetings back to back. And people are, you know, we're hearing stories of where people are having breakfast at 3 p.m. because they sat down in the morning, they've been back to back, and they haven't had a chance to, to stop and have a moment. What was that me you were describing? <laughs> I can relate to that, no trouble at all. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and therefore that isolation is increased because in the office we might stop and have a coffee with somebody. We might chew, chew the fat over the weekend, you know, what's been happening. You know, we've just got over storm something or other. Yeah. And, and, you know, the impact of that and it's generated different conversations and connections and we're missing that, really. Yeah. Yeah. Some simple techniques work. I know uh, for a long time I was doing hour, 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 hour mm. back to back meetings, and uh, I realised that some of the people I was working with and connecting with, they do 55 minute meetings. Mm. So they Clever. do like five past the hour to five two, or maybe on the hour. So there's always a five or a 10 minute gap, yeah. even if it's just so that you can go and answer a call of nature. Yeah, I was doing a meeting, stopping, next meeting starts yeah. instantly. And just getting your head into the right space so mm. that you can focus on what the next subject matter is takes a bit of doing. I think you're right, absolutely, it really does. And, and I think organisations right now are starting to realise that the relationships that we had going into the pandemic, some of that has been used up and we're having to develop new sometimes people are joining the organization and having never met anybody and and how how do we do that virtually and that's one of the big challenges at the moment is how do we develop meaningful relationships with working from home co-location yeah um you know some people only two days in the office a week um and how all of that works and there's some of the big challenges now yeah mm -hmm. yeah so where do you think Emotional intelligence provides the biggest benefit. And I give you a wide scope from business to personal. Yeah. And if it's in business or personal, what area of the, Where do you think there, there's some big wins that people should engage and understand AI a bit more? That's a big question, but I do <laughs> like it. Um, I, I think... You know, having worked now for a couple of decades in this sector of emotional intelligence, it's, it's clear I was an early adopter. And for me, that's been quite a personal journey. You know, when I first started with emotional intelligence, I would say I was probably emotionally dysfunctional. I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know what it looked like. And it had an impact on relationships, on how I did things. And so I've had quite, uh, you know, a personal uh, learning journey along that way and it's actually opened up quite quite a broad and deep level of under understanding and awareness so I've learned about how my confidence shows up and so having to work with senior leaders and senior leadership teams 10 or 15 years ago I'd have said I don't think I'll ever do that Ian and now that's all I do yeah you know how I work in expressing um, and sharing stories and basically moving people's perspective or mindset to be able to change behavior. And, and that's really powerful and a privilege, I personally, I think. And then the, the interpersonal and the relationship, bit, developing empathy that brings trusted relationship that not only brings value inside an organization, but how they work with their clients as well. So there's organizationally, I think that you get a lot of bang for your buck with emotional intelligence. But I think some of the biggest successes that not only I've experienced personally, but a lot of the people that we work with is in people's personal lives. You know, we practice a lot at work in how yep. we behave and we get quite professional at it but in home life where we're in that place of ultimate trust and security and love we let things go a little bit and I know me I sometimes after a busy day I've been able to go home and systematically hack everybody off in the house and it was nothing to do with them <laughs> it was all to do yep. with me yep. 
Now I'm much better at that now. I've learned that my size 11 foot shaped mouth could be a bit smaller. Yep. And my wife would attest to that. I I'm guarantee. almost the other way around. Okay. When I go home, I can tell what sort of a day my wife's had. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. So I think she's probably got a size six or five shaped foot mouth as yeah. well. Um, and she's not going to watch any of these podcasts I might hear seem to add. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we've, so we've been married for 31 years and we've often commented all the way through married life that you should treat your partner, yeah. husband or wife, as though they were either, you were in the courting phase yeah. or they were a mistress. Yeah. Because we've said to people, why do people stray from married mm. life? It's excitement, mm. it's new, it's novel, it's shared experiences. It's that bond that you had when you were at the early stages of your uh, romantic mm. uh, connection. And when you've been together 31 years, you know each other inside out. Mm. So treat that person as you would treat, you know, in my case, a mistress, mm. you know. Go out for the lovely meals, mm. ask how their day's been, treat them really well, do mm. what you would do. But do that for your existing partner and that will make might not be the answer to everything but that will make a massive difference mm -hmm. because you're treating that person new and fresh every day um, I agree and and I love that angle actually um, a lot of people when they hear about emotional intelligence they think you know have I got it what is it it's very academic it's a bit sciencey you know with emotional intelligence and the truth of the matter is we've all got it and we're all developing it whether we know what it's called or not yep. and, and what you've described there is a great example of learning to be together to get the best out of each other even when it isn't great yep. you know because life isn't great yeah, yeah, sometimes absolutely um, and that's what emotional intelligence is all about you know how I show up and how do I cope with that yeah yeah, yeah. so this isn't the one-way street, by the way. You can ask me questions. Okay. So, uh, as we reach towards the end of this session, yeah. I'll usually say to the person in the chair opposite, have you got anything you want to ask me? Okay. And I'm an open book. It could be about work. It could be about software. It could be about private life. It could be, you know. Yeah. Okay, well, let me ask hit you. Hit me a, with a question. Let me ask you a question, Ian. Um, you know, you're a successful business leader. I don't know how many years you've had the business open now. Almost 20. 20, so two decades. When you think of leaders in organisations, if you were going to give them your top two tips for you know being a leader of an organisation, what would your top Ooh, two Oh, that's really tips? interesting because I think my top two tips will feed straight back into your subject matter of emotional intelligence. Okay. So... I would stress from the outset, culture, culture, culture. Mm. And there's a nice old phrase, and I'm a massive believer in it, culture eats attitude for breakfast. Mm. Get your culture right. It's easy to do that while you're a small organisation. Mm. Make sure you do it and make sure you maintain it as you grow. Mm. So I'd say culture above all else. Yeah. And every... A senior leadership team meeting we start we start with a slide on the board we don't read it out we don't dwell on it it's yeah. there while we're getting our coffees and getting established and getting ready and that slide and it has an algorithm underneath it that slide says total trust and teamwork mm. and total trust is easy to say not easy to do mm. and there are so in business life there are so many things that become miscommunicated, mm. misinterpreted, misread, whatever it might be. Uh, when you've got total trust, you don't misread anything. Mm. You take it at face value and take it to the bank. If that was instructed, said, commented on, whatever, you know, it isn't questioned because you can absolutely trust those statements and say, right, that's what we get on with. Mm. Yeah. So I think total trust and teamwork, the three T's, mm. for me is what makes teams work. Mm. If you don't have trust, you don't have a team. Yeah. You've got a group of people, but they don't trust each other. And if they don't trust each other, they're not a team and they won't operate effectively. So seeing as this is emotional intelligence, yeah. they would genuinely be my top two pieces of advice. Yeah. Culture, 
above yeah. everything else, total trust and teamwork. Uh, and I think they bed, make bed trust. I think they make absolute sense, foundational sense, like you're describing. Yeah. And for me, with emotional intelligence, when you think about culture, if I get my culture right as an individual in understanding me and how my behavior impacts others, then that helps me then demonstrate that to others, which builds on that organizational culture. Yeah. So I think it's crucial for business leaders to have that, that area of understanding. And you and I have probably both experienced leaders that might lack some of that self-awareness and we know who talks about them. It's often the team, isn't it? Yep. Um, yep. So I completely And as human that. beings, we're all flawed. Yes. There's no such thing as a perfect human being. No. But if you've got the culture and the trust right, mm. you accept the flaws, <coughs> you accept mistakes to some degree, um, because that's part of teamwork. You look yeah. after each other, you look after the organization, yes. you look after the customers. So that culture and that attitude flows out from the top down, everybody in the organization and out to customers. Yeah. And customers can tell. Yes. They might not understand what we're talking about at that detail, but they can tell when organizations deliver good, you know, go the extra yard mm. service. Uh, and that's built into the people. Mm. Yeah, it's not done artificially, mm. it's not by instruction, mm. it's the culture of the organization mm. in the first place. And just building on that trust element, Ian, the thing that I found the most powerful in recent years um, is, is vulnerability. And for me to trust you, I have to open myself up, my good, and my not so good, and trust that you're gonna look after that and that we might be able to work together with that. And when a team or a leader realizes actually sharing that vulnerable stuff, what I'm not so good at, what I need help with, that ability to ask for help, when those things start to happen, I agree with you, that trust, it not only goes high within the organization, but people do see it out of the organization and here's what happens. I see people saying, I wouldn't mind working there. That looks like a great place to work. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And we see that as well. We mm. see that as well. Um, so I think that's drawn us. You only get one question, by the way. <laughs> I think that's drawn us to a close. Um, so Gary, it's been a pleasure. And I've learned a little myself during that. And I think this conversation might continue now afterwards. Um, yeah, it's been a pleasure to talk about that. Thanks, and thanks for having me on. And uh, thanks for your two top tips. I, I think I might take those away and use those again. Yep, no trouble. Thanks, Gary. Thanks.